City of Ghosts by Victoria Schwab, Chapter 3. Before we go any further, I have to back up. You see, there are three things you need to know. Thing one, for as long as I can remember, I've taken pictures. Dad says that the world is always changing, every second of every day, and so is everything in it, which means that the you, you are right now, is the, a different you to who you were when I started reading this sentence. Crazy, right? And our memories change too. For instance, I could swear that the teddy bear I had growing up was green, but according to my parents, it was orange. But when you take a photograph, things stay still. The way that they are is the way that they were and the way that they will always be, which is why I love pictures. Thing two, my birthday's in late March, right at the place where the seasons run together, when the sun's warm, but the wind's cold and the trees are starting to blossom, but the ground hasn't quite thawed. Mum likes to say I was born with one foot in winter and the other in spring. That's why I can't sit still and why, according to her, I'm always searching for trouble because I don't belong to one place. Thing three, we live in a suburban town surrounded by fields and hills and a fair number of ghosts and trees that change colour and rivers that freeze for the winter and a hundred picture perfect landscapes. These three things don't seem connected, the photos and the time and the place, but they're all important, I promise, threads in the fabric. For my 11th birthday, Mum and Dad gave me a ca camera, the vintage one you already know about with the purple strap and an old school flash and an aperture that you rotate by hand. All the kids at school use their phones as cameras, but I wanted something solid, something real. It was love at first sight and right away I knew where I wanted to go and what I wanted to shoot. There's this place a few miles from our house, a cleft in the hills, and when the sun sets, it sets right there, nested between the two slopes, like a ball cupped in someone's hands. I'd been there a dozen times and it never looked the same. I had this idea of going every day for a year, capturing every sunset, and I wanted to start right then. Remember what I said about being born in March? Well, for the first time that year, it was actually warm enough to ride my bike, even if the air still had a bite to it, as Mum likes to say. So I looped the camera's purple strap around my neck and took off towards the hills on my bike, racing against the sun, tyres hissing over half-frozen ground, through the streets, past the soccer fields and onto the bridge. The bridge. A short stretch of metal and wood suspended over the water. The kind of bridge you had to take turns on because it wasn't wide enough for two cars. I was halfway across when the truck whipped around the curve and hurtled towards me. I swerved out of the way and so did the truck, tyres screeching as my bike slammed into the railing hard enough to make sparks fly, hard enough to send me over the handlebars and over the railing. I fell. It sounds simple, doesn't it? Like a stumble, a trip, a skinned knee. But it was 20 feet down into water that had only days before been frozen solid. And when I broke the surface, the force and the cold knocked all the air from my lungs. My vision went white and then black, and by the time it came back I was still sinking, the camera like a lead weight around my neck pulling me down. The river darkened, the surface above a shrinking ripple of light. Somewhere beyond the water I thought I saw someone, the smudge of a person, a shadow, but then the shadow was gone and I was still sinking. I didn't think about dying. I didn't think about anything except the icy water in my lungs, the pressing weight of the river, and even those things started to th fade, and all I thought was, I'm falling away from the light. They tell you to go towards it, and I tried, but I couldn't. My limbs were too heavy. There was no air left. I don't remember what happened next. Not exactly. The world did a kind of stutter, like when a movie freezes, gets jammed, skips forward, and then I was sitting on the riverbank, gasping for air as a boy crouched beside me in jeans and a superhero t-shirt his blonde hair sticking up as if he'd just run his fingers through it. That was close, he said. At the time, I had no idea. What happened? I asked through chattering teeth. You fell in, he said. I pulled you out. Which didn't make sense, because I was soaked through, but he wasn't even wet. Maybe if I hadn't been shivering so hard, maybe if my eyes weren't aching from the river, maybe if my head wasn't full of ice, I would have noticed his strange grey pallor, the way I could almost almost see through him. I was too tired, too cold. I'm Jacob, he said. Cassidy, I said, slumping back onto the bank. 
Hey, he said, leaning over me. Stay awake. I heard other voices, then the slam of car doors, a skidding of boots up down the half-frozen bank, the distant warmth of someone's coat, but I couldn't keep my eyes open. When I woke up, I was in a hospital bed, and mum and dad were there, so their hands so warm on mine. Jacob was there too, sitting cross-legged in a spare hospital chair. It didn't take me long to realise no one else could see him. My camera was on the bedside table, the purple strap frayed and the viewfinder cracked. It was damaged, but not ruined, changed, but not destroyed, kind of like me. A little special, a little strange, not quite alive, but definitely not. I mean, can someone really die if they don't end up dead? Are they really alive if they come back? The word for that seems like it should be undead, but I'm not a zombie. My heart has that steady thump thump and I eat and sleep and do all the things that go with living. Near death, that's what they call it, but I know it wasn't just near. I was standing right on top of it, under it, long enough for my eyes to adjust the way they would in a dark room, long enough to, for me to make out the edges of the space before being dragged back into the bright, cold light. In the end, I guess mum was right. I have one foot in winter and one in spring, one foot with the living and one with the dead. A week later, I found the veil. Jacob and I were taking a walk, trying to wrap our heads around our strange connection. I mean, I'd never been haunted before, and he'd never haunted anyone when it happened. We were cutting through an empty lot, and all of a sudden I felt it, the tap, tap, tap of someone staring, the shivery sensation of a spider web on bare skin. I saw the edge of gray, the grey cloth at the corner of my sight. I should have looked away, but I didn't. I couldn't. Instead, I felt I, myself turn towards it. I caught the curtain in my hand, and for an instant I was falling again, crashing through the surface of the river, but I didn't let go. And when I blinked, Jacob was still next to me, only he looked solid real and just as confused as I was and the empty lot wasn't empty anymore. We were standing inside a warehouse, the crank and clank of metal echoing off the walls and someone somewhere was sobbing. The veil itself didn't scare me but that sound, the sense of walking into someone else's life or death, scared me and I pulled free of that place as fast as I could, wiping off the veil as if it were just a spiderweb stuck to my clothes. I swore I'd never go back. I thought I was telling the truth. But a couple of weeks later, I felt it again. The tap, tap, tap. The brush of that grey cloth. And before I knew it, I was reaching out, taking hold, pulling the curtain aside, while J Jacob groaned and sulked, and grudgingly followed me through. And here we are, one year later. For most people, life and death are pretty black and white. But something happened that day when Jacob pulled me out of the water. I guess I pulled him out of somewhere too, and we got sort of tangled up. And now I'm not all alive, and he's not all dead. If we were in a comic book, this would be our origin story. Some people get a spider bite or a vat of acid. We got a river. <laughs>